Welcome to Hollow Earth Radio Seattle, Goddess Kring Podcast number 46. I'm going to talk about how to survive in an expensive city like Seattle when you're a low income person like me. I guess I should start by talking about my background a little bit. I grew up uh, with an artist mother. My parents divorced when I was four and my mom and I were always low income. And so I grew up with sort of like not the notion of having lots of money. My dad always had like a more normal full-time job, but he's also very frugal and careful with money. And so I kind of grew up in a certain environment and I was taught certain things. And let me just say that ever since I moved out of my mother's house when I was 17 and graduated from high school, uh, I've kind of had a fear of scarcity which isn't a real positive thing, but ironically, part of my flaw of having a fear of scarcity and afraid that I'm going to run out of money or run out of, of whatever and not have enough has driven me to be very cautious and very frugal. And so right now, I live in a city called Seattle, Washington, USA, where the rent is skyrocketing because in this city we have, you know, Amazon, Microsoft, Starbucks, Boeing, and lots of large corporations that are bringing in lots of new jobs. And, you know, there are people who make like $9,000 a month. And so to them, paying $3,000 a month for rent is no big deal. That's actually affordable. But for somebody like me that probably makes between 15, maybe 1,700 at the most dollars per month, uh, I cannot afford more than that for my rent. And so I was lucky enough to receive a low-income housing voucher after being on a waiting list for a few years and I feel very very lucky to have my number called and so now my rent is actually a third of my income guaranteed and if my income goes up or down then my rent is adjusted accordingly so that it stays at 33 percent of my income and I wish that everybody could have that kind of rent because if somebody only makes minimum wage then they really cannot afford market rate for rent so probably market rate for my apartment would be almost as much as the total that I make per month like I live in a one-bedroom apartment with my own parking space and my own washer and dryer and I feel so grateful and the landlord is a really nice person and I am very fortunate and when I found this apartment it was before I had my low-income voucher and I I have basically found a series of landlords including the current one that I'm renting from right now who intentionally charge less than market rate because they feel like they make enough of a profit and they don't have to jack the rent up as high as possible. So I guess there are some landlords, because we don't have rent control in Seattle, and I guess there are some landlords who actually care and have compassion for people that are not, you know, super wealthy. So I, one way that I have survived with the kind of income that I have is I have found apartments uh, that were rented by independent, you know, instead of large corporation type management companies, I have rented from places that are reasonable and intentionally don't charge and these as much as market rate will allow. Um, But these landlords also have had buildings like I don't live in a super fancy building, but it's totally clean and safe and meets, you know, all of the codes, you know, safe water and electricity and security and, you know, just a good solid building and I've, I've found a series of these this is at least my third or fourth apartment where they don't charge tons of money and I know that rent you know is skyrocketing in Seattle right now it's the year 2017 as I'm recording this 
And some people make lots and lots and lots of money. The rest of us, our, our income is sort of stagnating and not really going up as high as the rent is going up. So I wanted to share with you some of the strategies. I actually wrote a blog post about this too. If you're interested, just go to shannonkringa.com and I have a WordPress, a Tumblr, a Live Journal, a Google Plus. Um, and I. I talked on my journal recently about this and somebody suggested or I suggested maybe I'll do this on my podcast and some people were like yeah do this I want to hear it so I wrote that um, I'm an amazingly frugal person and good with money and I survive quite well on my low income I've pretty much been low income my entire life and it just felt normal to just do things in a really kind of um, careful frugal way in in a non-wasteful way and I always liked shopping in thrift stores since I was like a teenager and I grew up on Whidbey Island we had this really cool thrift store and I liked to dress in creative ways and so I liked shopping at the thrift store because I could find unusual clothes that were like one of a kind um, instead of just conforming and wearing the same old thing that every other teenager wore, I, from a young age, liked to be a nonconformist. And so to me, thrift stores were, were dual purpose. They were on my budget. I could afford to go and shop at the thrift store. And I could also find unusual items that weren't like the same cookie cutter type clothing that everybody else was wearing. So I liked it for those two reasons. And I still, to this day, shop at thrift stores for the same two reasons, because you can find unusual things and you can buy a lot, big bang for your buck, basically. So I also shop at stores. Uh, I don't really want to mention all the names of the different stores, but I, I shop at certain stores that have uh, discounts on I like to get organic foods and I go to the food bank. There's like two or three different food banks in my neighborhood that I can qualify to go to. And a lot of the food is not very healthy. Um, but I have a friend that I, I uh, give the excess food to that is not healthy enough for me that this person loves to eat. And so I share it with this other person and whatever is healthy, I, I get free food from the food banks and that really helps stretch my budget. And then I shop at stores that are reasonable. And I don't think I should mention the, the brands of these different stores on my show, but <laughs> I rarely eat out. And when I do eat out, I just drink water because it's free. I also go to the artesian well and get free um, drinking water from the earth, which doesn't have any chlorine or fluoride in it. And that's amazing. Usually I never spend more than $10 if I eat out but I don't eat out very often because I don't really like to spend money in that way. I would rather actually cook something at home. And my boyfriend and I actually sometimes go out to uh, Mexican food and we get fajitas. But w what we do is we split to save on calories and to save on money. We get one order of fajitas, which is actually huge. And it's supposed to be just for one person, but we split it. So basically our, our dinner, you know, be like $14 for each of us if we each got an order of fajitas but when we split it it's like seven bucks you know plus the tip and plus tax so basically you can get a meal at a restaurant and just eat half of it and then it's two meals so it's basically half price and you eat less calories because a lot of portions are really large anyway so half that is just fine and I also park for free I, I uh, have a car and it gets really good gas mileage. It's a tiny little European car and it gets good gas mileage and I bought it used. I found a good deal on it and got it used. I basically know where to park for free. If you uh, explore your neighborhood and you drive up and down the roads, a lot of them are like two hour parking or you have to pay to park or there's parking lots. Basically, I scour the neighborhoods and I find streets. There are a few streets in most neighborhoods that do not have any parking signs they're just free parking and I know where these places are and I scope them out and I find them and then I plan ahead when I'm gonna work somewhere because I work as an art model for uh, drawing and painting people I find a place to park that's free and then I'm willing to walk up to half an hour to get to where I'm going and usually 
actually, sometimes I just ride my bicycle. If I live close enough to a place where I can ride my bike within half an hour, I generally don't like to ride more than about 30 minutes on my bicycle at a time, up to an hour though, really. And then it's free parking and there's no traffic jam. So you can ride your bicycle if you're healthy and able enough. You can ride your bike to save money and not spend anything on parking and avoid traffic jams. I, I did that recently when I went to the Tom Petty concert. Um, I rode my bike there uh, and it was down downtown at one of the big stadiums and it was like jam packed people everywhere traffic jams everywhere and I was able to just ride my bike and park for free and then at the end of the night I got to ride my bike home and I got exercise so you can walk you can ride your bike if you have a car you can park far away from where you're going if you know where to park for free and then you just walk and so then you get exercise and you save money if I actually did everything like the mainstream normal way that some people do it like pay full price for everything and not look for discounts, I would probably need like $5,000 a month or more just to survive in terms of like, you know, I never go to the beauty salon. I don't really wear a lot of makeup, but if I do buy makeup, I just get, you know, fine sales. And f I don't buy like lotion or skin cream. I just use coconut oil. So if you're not allergic to coconut oil, because some people are, uh, you can just go to the health food store and the two stores where I go, I guess I will mention, it's Trader Joe's and Costco. Those are where I find really good deals and there's organic things. And I get coconut oil. And it's only like $6 for a big jar and that lasts me quite a while. And I use that for my skincare. I use that for my lotion on my arms and legs and face and I, I rub it on my feet. And you can even eat it. And so it's inexpensive and it's unscented because I don't really like a lot of the chemicals that they put in, in beauty products. And so it is very safe for your skin and non-toxic and it's a good price and it's even edible. And I even feed some coconut oil to my cat. It's actually safe to feed dogs and cats. It's good for their fur. It's good essential fatty acids. So I feed that to my cat and I use it for my skin cream. And I don't go to nail salons. If I usually just keep my fingernails natural, but I paint my toenails sometimes and I just do it at home by myself and it's really inexpensive. And you can always just have friends like paint each other's toenails. If, you, if it's hard for you to paint your own toenails, just have your friend come over and paint each other's toenails together. It's much cheaper than spending, you know, $20, $30 on a pedicure. I've been to Europe. I have, it's true that I have had friends donate frequent flyer miles to me and I've actually received some of my own frequent flyer miles by earning points and I've actually gone on very inexpensive flights places because of that. But once I get to Europe, there's a website called couchsurfing.com and that's where people want to host you when you're a traveler. And so there's a free place for you to stay. And I've had mostly very good experiences. I stayed in England and Scotland and Canada at a couch surfing hosts uh, place. And sometimes it's, it is just a couch that you sleep on and other times they have a spare room for you or you sleep on someone's floor uh, with a mattress, you know, like an air mattress on the floor. And it's inexpensive. It's basically a free place to stay because they want to host you. And they usually want to tell you about their city and have conversations with you and learn about wherever you're from. And so if you're from a different country, it's especially fun to share with people about where what your country or what your city is like. Um, I have stayed with friends in Scotland and Norway and England and Australia and I went to Mexico once and Mexico is actually fairly inexpensive um, so that's how I did that and we actually got invited to stay with Mexican families when we were there and we didn't spend a lot on hotels because people invited us to stay with them they were very friendly you do have to be very careful and make sure that you feel safe when you stay with somebody that you don't know uh, but couchsurfing.com has a way of screening people and verifying people and then they recommend each other and so I've had very good experiences with that website and that's free it's all free to join and free to um, to promote yourself as a host and or uh, try to find somebody that wants to host you 
And let's see what else. I went to Norway. Norway was the most expensive place I've ever been in Europe. And a friend of mine invited me to stay with her. So I had a place to stay in Oslo. And the most expensive thing I noticed was in Oslo, the airport is kind of far away from downtown Oslo. And there was no inexpensive. There was just a bus that was like $35 each way to go from the airport to downtown Oslo. So I had to spend $70 round trip on that. And Norway is very expensive. And so I definitely only drank water when I was in Norway, like tap water. And it was uh, safe, you know, to drink in my friend's house. She had a water filter. So I just um, had a, a water bottle that I kept reusing and I kept filling it up with water. And I went to grocery stores. Basically, I just shop for food in grocery stores when I go to Europe mostly. And then I don't, I rarely eat out. Uh, I have eaten in some fast food places in Europe, but I generally don't like to eat fast food, but that definitely is less expensive than the fancy restaurants. I don't know. I'm just, I'm very, very careful with money and I'm very, I'm willing to kind of rough it and tough it. Maybe I kind of tough it more than some people would be willing to tough it, but those are some of the things I do is shop in thrift stores and do couchsurfing.com. I get natural shampoo at Trader Joe's for like $3 and I use coconut oil as my moisturizer and I like shop online for shoes and I usually find them like 50% off and if they're not on sale I usually don't get them and I've also found things at thrift stores like like bras that are like $40 new or more and at thrift stores are like three or four dollars and there's really usually nothing wrong with them they're just a little bit worn and somebody just doesn't like it or just gets bored with it and I bring my calculator with me everywhere I go and I do the math and I add and subtract and multiply and divide <laughs> and I know some people wouldn't be willing to do all of this but I, I certainly am those are my main tips for right now and I wanted to add about traveling I mostly the reason why I love to travel is to take photographs, like artistic photographs, and write in my journal and then share about it with my online community. So I feel like what drives me to travel is to visit friends and learn about different cultures and do artwork. And so I guess for me, it's easy to not spend a lot of money when I travel because I don't go there to buy things. I go there to visit friends and, and create art, basically take photos and write in my journal, which doesn't cost anything. So I think that my activity that I love to do doesn't really cost anything. And another thing that I do here in Seattle is I love to go to the library and check out you know, books and DVDs, and it doesn't cost anything. We can all share the public library, which is basically like a socialized system. And rich, poor, young, old, we can all share the library, and we don't have to spend money when we go there. And I am so, so, so grateful that we have libraries in Seattle that are so nice and so great, and they're air-conditioned on a really hot day. You can go to the library and cool off and not spend any money and enjoy books and videos and if you have your smartphone or your laptop with you, you can watch Netflix if you have that or just watch, you know, videos on the Internet for free. And if you have a laptop with a, a DVD player, you can check out library DVDs and watch them there. So that's something you can do without spending money as well. <laughs>
was a little pan flute that I played on my keyboard improvisationally. I like to do improvisational music and poetry and spoken word. You can go to shannonkringa.com and just click on music and find the link. I also have a band camp and it's all free and you can like listen to my mp3s. And the Seattle Public Library actually has, uh, Claxton Kent and I made an album together called Sing Kringnicity a few years ago and they have it for free to download and rent at the library and I'm really proud and happy about that. And they even, they even paid us a stipend for that. That was pretty amazing that they have the budget to even pay musicians. Uh, it's called Playback and it's local music at the Seattle Public Library collection of all different genres of music, including some of my music. So I'm really happy about that. And another thing people can do to save money is to trade with each other. Like I know there are groups online that are like free buy nothing groups and people offer things like they have extra things that they don't want to donate to the thrift store or try to sell. They just want to give them away and people who want things. So you can ask for what you want on these websites that are free to join. And so you can give and receive with people who want to let go of their stuff and share it with you for free. And you know, you can sort of live more off the grid. And instead of thinking that everything has to cost money, there are ways that we can barter with each other and share. And yeah, also just, I love to just do activities that don't cost any money, like go for a walk in the woods and just enjoy nature. I also volunteer at the zoo. And so I can go to concerts for free at the zoo in exchange for me helping them run the concert. And so I do like a three hour shift and then I can enjoy the rest of the concert and enjoy the animals at the zoo. I know a lot of people uh, have a lot of negative thoughts about zoos, but I myself see zoos as a mostly positive thing from what I have seen. So I, I see that as, as the glass is half full on that because the habitat of many animals is being destroyed. So that's a whole nother ball of wax right there. But I love to, to do volunteer work. So another way to save money for people is to find uh, organizations that you like. Like if you want to go to theater, you know, find out if you can volunteer at your local theater and be an usher and then you can see plays for free or a discount. And so you can you can be around a lot more theater. If you can't afford to go to a lot of live theater, you can volunteer and then be around theater. And the same thing with me being at the zoo and volunteering. You can volunteer at the aquarium. You can, you know, pick a place that you could volunteer if you want to be around things that you enjoy and you don't have a lot of money to spend, volunteering is a way to have access to things that you love without having to spend money. And then you can also feel like you're helping support that organization. That was a little abstract cring speak for you there. I kind of like to make up my own words and add echo to my voice. So not to go off topic, but I will say that I wish more things were funded in a socialized way in the United States. For instance, when I've gone to Europe, I've noticed a lot more bike racks. A lot more money is put into public art and put into really massive train stations and really massive mass transit. Like in Scotland, they have amazing buses, like really nice, clean buses that are fairly new. And they have the, the bus station in Scotland, in, in Edinburgh, Scotland, was so crowded that they needed a bunch of traffic uh, directors to work there directing the bus traffic and I've never seen such a busy bus station and this was just regular public buses and they were fairly reasonably priced and all the citizens get to share there's a certain attitude in some of the European countries that I've been of a cooperation and a socialized attitude of everyone gets health care and they pay their taxes and it's considered normal to have really good high-speed trains and buses and just trams and good mass transit and 
uh, affordable college and education. So not that these countries are perfect and utopian, uh, but the government clearly puts more money and the, ta the taxes and the government funding is very different. And yes, people say people pay really high taxes in, in Europe, but the friends that I've asked that are in Scotland and England and Norway, they tell me that their taxes are not like extremely huge and they generally make more money than I do here in this country. So some of the salaries that people make and the wages in some of these European countries are actually higher. The USA actually, it seems to me that we're known for having extremely low minimum wage and then the opposite, extremely high maximum wage. And so the income inequality is more extreme in the United States than it is in some of these European countries that I've been to. And I can't speak for all countries in the world, but the European countries I've been to specifically, they have national health care, meaning there's no medical bills for people and hardly any paperwork that you have to do. You just go to the clinic, you receive medical care, and there's no bill, and you pay your taxes. And you also get better mass transit when you pay your taxes and, and also just the electrical wires in some of these European cities I've been. A lot of Europe actually buries their electrical wires and it is more expensive to do it that way. But for whatever reason, they decided that was worth the investment, just like they decided it was worth the investment to have lots of train stations that could take people from one country to another. And I'm especially impressed with the high-speed trains, what is it, China or Japan that has the bullet train? I think it's Japan, and they go like 200 miles an hour. I mean, there's amazing trains. It would be so cool if the United States could have more money put into high-speed mass transit trains, as well as solar power plants and electric cars. That would be so cool. And so I will say that the reason why I brought this up is I was thinking about money and wanting to save money and how part of maybe the American way is to be frugal and careful and work hard and save your money, et cetera. You know, there's, there's an upside to that. And then the downside to that is that there's this feeling of competition that's like really too harsh and, and extreme and kind of stressful. And this feeling of having to worry about medical bills because our, our medical system is still based on profit, a profit model, which is totally bizarre. Makes no sense to me to have healthcare and medicine be part of the capitalist for profit system because then what motivates insurance companies is to make a profit and not to really take care of people. And so that in itself is unethical because I can see why, you know, if I worked for a health insurance company, my job would be to try to maximize the profit of that company, which w is a direct conflict of interest to trying to serve patients that are getting medical treatment and having to worry about medical bills. So that's really sad to me. So that ties in with money. And, and in the United States, a lot of people are um, anti-government and afraid of the government or thinking that we should have less government. But I think we should have more government, but better government. We should have a government where we actually pay our taxes and get national health care that's nonprofit and streamlined and simplified and better mass transit and high speed trains. I mean, I would happily pay even higher taxes if I was guaranteed socialized national health care that's nonprofit with no medical bills, just pay my taxes and not worry about medical bills and have better mass transit in this country, you know, trains that go all over to the 50 states. Think of how many people, I mean, even here in Seattle, we have pretty good trains and buses, I think, although there, there's been budget cuts. But there's this train that's so cool. I think it's called the Sounder. And I used to have a friend that lived in Kent. And I used to take the bus and it would take 70 minutes. And this train only takes 20 minutes. So it goes pretty fast. But the sad thing is, is that this Sounder train, I think it goes all the way from Tacoma to Everett, north and south, and it's really fast and a smooth ride, and you can even bring your bicycle, and I think it's only like three fifty or something, $3.50. And But it only runs, it only works for people who work 9 to 5, 
it doesn't really run like there's only like three trains in the morning and three trains at night and I think that's it and it's sad it's like and it's usually like packed when I've been on it it's been crowded so it's obviously popular so I'm thinking why don't they increase the budget so they can have more of those trains uh, more people would ride them so I'm a big fan of, of high-speed trains and getting people to ride their bikes and use more man mass transit. I, I actually love having a car. I've had my car for five years. Before that, I rode the bus for like 26 years and rode my bicycle everywhere. And so I really do love having a car, but I also use my bicycle a lot. And every once in a while, I will take the bus with my bike and take the light rail. And that's kind of fun. Um, but especially if I can, I like to drive because then I can park wherever I want and then walk to where I'm going and don't pay for parking. And it is like really a lot faster for me to drive my car than it is to take mass transit usually. But if we had more trains, I'm sure more people would, would take the trains. So I'm a fan of mass transit and I'm a fan of the idea that we pay taxes and that the government would actually do good things with the money instead of embezzle the money for themselves. Like, I don't know, is that what they do with all the money? Because where does all the money go? And I know most of the money goes to the military and the defense budget, which is also kind of out of balance. I think we should be putting more money into mass transit, the roads, the bridges, the infrastructure, solar power, you know, things that we, we use cooperatively. I was going to say that in some of the European countries I've been, there's this sort of feeling in the air of cooperation. And there's just more of a civilized, socialized atmosphere in terms of healthcare and mass transit and just an overall attitude that citizens have. There's less of a feeling of competition. There's higher wages. There's less poverty. And there's, from what I've seen, and there is more, um, uh, more of a relaxed feeling, less being workaholics, more of a balance between holidays and vacations, time with your friends and family, and then work time. There's more of a balance. There's more of a enjoy food, enjoy art museums, enjoy life and leisure time. Even in England, the the health clubs you know the places where you go to work out that's basically what they would call sports clubs and workout gyms we call them here in england or scotland i think it was scotland they're called leisure clubs and i think even my friend one of my friends in england calls some of them leisure clubs and it's like where people go so it's like there's this attitude of of that leisure time is important and it seems like a lot of americans are very much like you know work really hard 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 and then if you're lucky, you get to take a vacation if you can afford it. It's like in Europe, it's more like vacation and holiday is just a normal part of life. Just like eating and drinking and sleeping and brushing your teeth and relaxing. It's just a normal part of life, just like working. So working and relaxing are in more imbalance that, that I've seen. Not that Europe is utopia. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, the atmosphere that I've felt in even that is just more relaxed and less competitive and just like a different attitude. And even just people's lunch hours tend to be longer and people spend more time sitting in restaurants and eating in Europe. It's more of a, a more leisure, more, more relaxed pace. You can work hard, but then you can also relax hard. Whereas in the United States, there's this feeling of competition and everybody's in a rush and we needs to work really hard and chase after money. And it's just a different attitude. Uh, and I can feel it. But there's there's Americans who, who are more European in their thinking. I, I think that I am being a nude figure model. I'm around a lot of people who go to Europe and talk about Renaissance uh, art and paintings in Italy and France and Germany and all the different countries and Austria. And they talk about, you know, European ideas of, of having a passionate life and enjoying food and art and culture and music and theater and dance and um, balancing that with the idea of making money and having ambition. So there's like a heart and soul kind of feeling. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that. <laughs>
Kringen Kringen, Goddess Kringen, Seattle. And can I just say that I wish we could get beyond the duality as human beings. You know, like I wish it wasn't the us versus them, the them versus us, that I am female and you are male. I am black and you are white. I am left-handed and you are right-handed. You know, I am from this country and you are from that country. I am a Republican, you are a Democratic, you know, etc. Things like that, like labels. Like, it's true, even me, I label myself, I might be a little bit autistic, I might be a little bit borderline, I might be a little bit dyslexic, I'm artistic, I'm an artist and you're not. Or, I am a visual artist and you are a musician artist or a performing artist or... You are this and I am that. You are good at math and I'm good at science, you know, etc. It's like I realize that human beings need to differentiate between their traits versus another person's traits. But I sometimes feel like particularly with prejudice against somebody's ethnicity or skin color or um, uh, heritage or background, um, emphasizing people who are trying to maybe get prejudice to stop or at least get it validated that prejudice really does exist and I do agree prejudice exists racism sexism classism all the different prejudices in the world do exist and it's a very serious problem that humans have what I disagree with is how to solve it I feel like if people go around constantly pointing out us versus them and then not having empathy for somebody who is seen as having privilege and not and, and accusing them of not being able to acknowledge what they go through and saying ah shut up this isn't about you I don't think that's very helpful to say shut up this isn't about you although I understand the feeling and the urge when, when you're tired of being dominated by a certain kind of person it's natural to want to say hey shut up and let us talk now I un totally understand that but I almost feel like it perpetuates the us versus them when people do that. It just perpetuates the other side. Like that's how wars are started. One person blames the other and then they go back and forth and back and forth and they keep perpetuating a war between us versus them. And so I feel like the solution is to go beyond the duality of that and to actually treat each other with kindness and respect and decency and I know that also means we have to change the laws and if people are prejudiced that make the laws then that's how are we going to do that so how are people going to evolve past this us versus them duality you know thinking so I realize what I'm saying might upset some people so I'm sorry if you don't agree with me and you think I'm wrong and etc I understand we all have valid points of view I'm just saying that I see a pattern in the duality of how people think it's us versus as them and again that could be that could be racism classism sexism a political party what language you speak if somebody thinks that their language is superior to somebody else's language you know it's sad that we we think that we need to have a winners and losers it's too bad that we can't accept that we're all different we're all in this together i mean there's diversity there's unity in diversity as they say so it made it upsets me the duality that i see in the way people treat each other and i'm not saying that i'm perfect and i'm not saying that i don't do this us versus them kind of um, thing i'm sure that i probably do and I might be a hypocrite sometimes, but I try, like my philosophy is to try to see the unity and the connection that I have with other people, whether they're different than me or similar to me. Uh, but it's kind of hard to do sometimes. And I love to spend a lot of time to myself because of that and hang out with my cat. So beyond duality would be a nice thing for humans to evolve into. And also speciesism, when humans think they're superior to all the other species on the planet, I find that sad because look at the way humans dominate, you know, humans dominate this planet. I can hardly stand it. I wrote a poem, polluted and uprooted, and then I talk about different animals and, you know, how animals are going extinct and human beings. I also volunteer at the zoo and a lot of people have said they hate zoos and they don't like zoos. And I'm thinking, well, zoo, it's sad that we have animals in captivity, but it's equally sad that we have habitat that's being destroyed and animals being hunted and poached and um, the zoo, at least the animals are protected and they do have um access to a vet and get medical treatment, etc. Their babies are protected from predators, etc. 
Torn and torn, human form, reborn. Dominating crocodiles, cockroach slaughter, rats poisoned, fear of bats, extinction of creatures. People dominate this planet. I can hardly stand it. Stranded, polluted and uprooted. Wake up and smell the Hitler done to Mother Earth. Wake up and smell the Hitler done to Mother Earth. <sighs> People dominate this planet. I can hardly stand it. Earth drips blood. Elephants, gorillas, tiger, humpback whale, grizzly bear. Kind human. Be, honey. Be kind, honey. Be kind, honey. Should be fashioned to have compassion for all living things. Who do we think we are? Humans dominate this planet. I can hardly stand it. 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 So that was my poem called "Wake Up and Smell the Hitler," uh, about speciesism, basically. And I really love plants and animals, although I do eat meat sometimes. But I do feel weird about it. I feel like if I was really being pure and true to my heart, I would I would be a vegan probably, because of the way they treat animals, and environmentally because of the water and the waste of of uh, basically mass producing the meat and dairy industry mass producing meat and dairy for humans is very destructive to the environment but i also save spiders i i uh you know if there's a poison spider around me i'm definitely kind of afraid but generally speaking i always save spiders and i don't harm them uh if there's a poisonous spider around i just try to get away from it and i went to Australia once and there's some very dangerous spiders in Australia, huge spiders. And I, uh, I remember there was a giant spider on the porch and every day I would look and go, okay, where's that spider? Okay. And I would keep an eye on it and I would walk very carefully and make sure to not freak it out so that it wouldn't try to jump on me or whatever. Recently I found a huge spider in my apartment. I don't know what kind it was, but I very carefully put it into a jar and I took it outside and put it like in the grass far away from my apartment so <laughs> I don't know where that spider went but I don't think it came back into my apartment um, but I appreciate the different creatures and when I go to the zoo and volunteer I actually go and and look at the spiders and the cockroaches and the, basically the bug bug world and I appreciate the different creatures and the fact that you know bats um, eat a lot of bugs and you know some of these creatures you know the ecosystem is just amazing and all the different creatures and plants and animals and how they all give and receive and there's predators and hunters and prey and then there's animals that die and rot into the earth and fertilize and then they poop and fertilize the earth and then more plants grow and and when Mount St. Helens erupted, scientists thought the ecosystem would take a long time to come back. And what happened was the fungus came back within six months. There was these like spider web looking things on the ground and scientists discovered it was the fungus. And then the fungus led to uh, insects and then the insects led to bigger animals that were eating the insects. And then those animals pooped and then made the ground more fertile and then more more plants grew and basically around Mount St. Helens now the whole ecosystem is a different ecosystem than it was before the, the mountain blue so it's kind of amazing the resilience of nature which leads me to my next topic which is the new Tori Amos album is called Nature Invader and it's kind of about the resilience of nature you know with all the climate changes and having a a White House administration in this year 2017 we have people in the administration who don't seem to care about the environment and don't seem to take seriously the fact that we should be taking care of planet Earth because it's our home and so Tori Amos's new album is coming out in September and 2017 and it's called Nature Invader and I'm excited to listen to it I've heard a couple tracks from it and that's free online to pre-listen to 
and I might go see her. She's coming to Seattle, I think, in November of 2017. I've seen her many times live. I've met her three or four times at meet and greets, given her hand-painted shoes. She wore them on stage at the Paramount in 1996 in Seattle. I know I've told that story many times, but for anybody who's never heard it, I saw Tori Amos on MTV in 1992, and she did a song called Silent All These Years. Beautiful song. It completely hypnotized me and enthralled me, and I thought, wow, this is a very unique musician. She is very emotionally present, and she seemed just very present, very spiritual, mental, physical, emotional, sexual. It's all there. She's very alive and present and brave and has been through a lot. And I'm happy that her career is still going strong after like, gosh, 25 years she's been in the in the music business and well her whole life really she's like in her 50s now but she's just great and she's very unique and she's written so many songs and as we know Tom Petty and Tori Amos are my two favorite songwriters and I saw Tom Petty live recently and I actually requested Tori Amos do a Tom Petty song and she's like oh I'm not familiar with his music but my husband is a fan of his I'll I'll see what we can work up and then a few days later she did free falling uh, mashed up with Sarah McLaughlin's building a mystery which is a whole nother story and I've said that before but uh, Tori Amos and Tom Petty both have Native American blood and one of their grandparents I think Tori's grandfather was a a, a pure native you know 100% Native American blood person and Tom Petty's grandfather wait grandmother one of them I think Tom Petty had a grandmother that was a, a pure-blooded Indian and then Tori had the opposite and they're both kind of from the south she's from I think North or South Carolina and she partly lives in Florida now and in England with her husband but Tom Petty is I think his family is kind of from Georgia and then Gainesville Florida and then they moved to California or Tom moved to California to pursue his music career but there's kind of like this southern uh, roots kind of earthy quality that both of their music has to some extent and the whole Native American influence in terms of being grounded and in, into the earth and I don't know just I see some parallels but maybe that's just my own connecting the dots in my own eccentric way but they're both very prolific songwriters and I tend to listen to both of them I've made some uh, mix CDs lately for myself it's kind of like a checkerboard of all of my favorite Tom Petty and Tori Amos songs spliced together, A, B, A, B, Tori Tom, Tori Tom, Tori Tom. And so it's a really fun mixture. And a lot of my favorite songs written by both of them are not really the hit songs. Although Tori doesn't have a, a bunch of like hit songs on the radio kind of stuff. Tom Petty has a lot of, of hits that they play on the radio a lot. I don't even listen to the radio generally. This is Hollow Earth Radio Seattle. You're listening to Goddess Kring podcast number 46 station identification so yeah i generally don't listen to a lot of radio except for hollow earth radio that's what i listen to and because i like local independent uh handmade type stuff and i love the freedom and democracy of making it up as we go and i like that it's non-commercial and this is just about freely sharing music and ideas and words and philosophy and whatever we want with our free speech and that is wonderful and I celebrate that so I will say that actually the Tom Petty concert I went to with my dad was really really fun but it was the 40th anniversary tour and so they mostly played their hits and what was really sad and I love their hits but I my favorite songs are their more obscure songs like um a Face in the Crowd, Magnolia, Luna, from their new album, uh, Power Drunk, Shadow People. There's just a lot of, especially Power Drunk is relevant to right now in, in history with our current administration in the White House, which is really kind of horrifying and embarrassing a lot of people. It's just really, really strange. Um, lack of diplomacy, lack of ethics, lack of integrity, etc. So I think that being a rebel can be a good thing, but I think of Donald Trump as being a very negative kind of rebel, like he rebels against what is right and good and ethical. <laughs> and he, you know, goes with what is 
I think he thinks he's a really cool rebel kind of guy, but I don't uh, see the good rebel. I, th- I see Bernie Sanders as more of a positive rebel in terms of rebelling against the status quo and trying to make things better in terms of getting the United States to have single payer nonprofit health care like most of the rest of the world already has for all citizens, rich, poor, young, old, sick and healthy, etc. So and taking care of the environment and having more solar power and more electric cars and more of a feeling of cooperation and where where it's not just the rich people against the poor people, but there's more of a, like I said previously, beyond the duality of rich and poor, young and old, sick and healthy, Republican, Democrat, whatever you want to call yourself. I am kind of a democratic socialist if I have to, if I had to label myself, you know, I like democracy and I like capitalism, but I feel like capitalism should be ethical and there should be some regulations that protect us from extreme abusive capitalism, which makes it so that we can't have unions and you can pay somebody really low wages. And then people at the top make like $10,000 an hour. People at the bottom only make eight or $9 an hour. Now that's crazy. So it seems like minimum wage should be at least $15 an hour. And then maximum wage should maybe, you know, nobody needs $10,000 an hour. So, you know, maybe we need to rethink that you know a more equal distribution of wealth communism is a little too extreme for me but i i do like the idea in communism of equality and of a less competitive kind of feeling where there's a little bit more equality and a little bit but i would like there to be like a ladder that you can climb like you can start at you know 15 dollars an hour and then if you want to you can climb your way up and make more money and be more ambitious and be you know the head of a company or a manager or whatever, if that's what you want to do. Um, Art modeling, actually, I've done it for 25 years. And when I started art modeling, it was a lot more than minimum wage. And now 25 years later, it's sadly, my wages have not gone up very much. I definitely am happy. I make like 15 or $20 an hour usually, and sometimes up to $30 an hour at some places like for medical students. But the thing is, minus taxes I have to do my own taxes on some of that and but the thing is it hasn't really kept up with inflation so I I am a low-income person and I model full-time but I'm freelance and so my schedule is random and sometimes I'm really busy and have 12-hour days and then other days you know I only work like three hours you know for one art class that's three hours long So basically, I'm still low income, even though my hourly wage is better than minimum wage. But I will say that if modeling had kept up with inflation, I would probably make $30 an hour at every place. And so it hasn't really. So basically, what I'm saying is, is that the wages I make as an art model are not as high as they used to be because of inflation. So that's a little bit sad to me. Um, so wages in the United States, you know, could be more ethical and more fair. And I believe in having unions. One of the reasons why I like to shop at Costco is because I know the CEO of Costco has said that he wants to pay his workers a fair wage and that he is, he is wealthy enough and he doesn't need to be more wealthy. And so he decided to let them all have unions, give them a good vacation and benefits package. So Although if we had single payer health care in the United States, you see that would actually simplify our system to the point where there'd be less paperwork for, for medical patients that go see doctors and doctors could help focus on helping the patients and treating them instead of fighting with insurance companies on whether they're going to pay or not and negotiating the price. So single payer health care would make it also so that companies like Costco or Trader Joe's or any company out there would not have to give their employees like my friend in England, his his health care is with the national NHS, National Health Service, and it has nothing to do with his job. So he pays taxes. A very small percentage of his paycheck is taken out for health care. And he can go see a doctor and not get a bill. So it really has nothing to do with his job. It's just about the taxes. And so if healthcare in the United States was single payer, it would be separate from our job, separate from our employment, and everybody would be covered. So therefore, when you change jobs, when you quit your job or get fired from your job or you have no job, you still get your healthcare. So it's a much uh, easier system, and it actually costs less than what we already have. And so that's what I'm saying about... I like democracy and capitalism, 
but there needs to be a little socialism mixed in, meaning we need to have ethics and fairness and fair wages for people and health care for all and better mass transit. So to me, that's more of a, a socialized democracy versus cutthroat competitive capitalist democracy, which is a little too extreme and stressful because then poverty skyrockets. If things are really competitive, it's very stressful for, for the population. And I actually think the more poverty we have, the higher the crime rate is. And less poverty means less crime, generally speaking, because I think a lot of people that commit crimes are just very angry at the system. And they feel like they have to cheat and steal in order to just survive. And that's really sad to me. And it's sad that there's more and more homeless people here in Seattle and there's more poverty. And I just feel so lucky and fortunate that I got on that waiting list and I have my rent that's a third of my income. And I have, like I said earlier in the show, I have strategies, shop at thrift stores and various things that I do, go to food banks, do various things to cut the cost of what I need to survive. So basically, if you have an inexpensive way of living, then you don't need tons of money to survive. So some people think that you need to have, you know, make at least $50,000 a year just to be okay. It's true that I don't have any kids and I just have a cat. I have a lot of house plants and a cat and myself, and that's all I have to take care of. And so it's true that if I had kids, my life would be more expensive and complicated. That is very true. I also feed my cat raw meat uh, special health food I get at the health food store which actually is more expensive than the really cheap cat food that you can buy but the thing is it's very dense it's very nutritious food that I feed him and so he actually eats less there's no waste and so and it's all in my freezer and I just feed him a little bit at a time and so I'm finding that it actually at first seemed like it was going to be a lot more expensive to feed my cat in this healthy new way but ever since, for about like the last eight months, I've been feeding him this way and he's very healthy and his health has improved a lot. And um, he was having some issues with his digestion and the vet thought he might be diabetic. And to make a long story short, basically, it seems like it was more expensive at first, but now I'm noticing that he eats less because every morsel of food that he eats is completely nutritious for him. And so it actually, if I feed him too much, he'll throw up because it's very strong, dense food, raw meat. It's, and it's not just raw meat, it's specially formulated at, from the, at the health food pet store. And so they, they grind it up like it's raw meat and egg, eggs and other things crushed into it. And so it's like a special balanced, uh, nutritionally balanced for all life stages type food that I give him. So it's very safe. And I'm very careful about that, that I feed him really high quality stuff that's nutritionally balanced for all life stages. That's what Dr. Karen Becker recommends online. She's a vet and um, she has good advice. So basically, I can afford to feed my cat really high quality food because he eats less of it than he did when I fed him this supposedly healthy food, which he ended up wasting half of because he really didn't like it that much and it was hard for him to digest. So now my cat eats really high quality food and it really only costs a little bit more than my previous food that I was giving him.
improv keyboard for you there. Thanks for listening. This is Hollow Earth Radio Seattle. Follow your heart. Follow your heart. Manifest your, your dreams. Manifest your dreams. Manifest your dreams. Your dreams. Your dreams. Your dreams. Your dreams. Peace and love. Goddess Kring Radio. Goddess Kring. Shannon Kring. Goddess Kring. Shannon Kring. Goddess Kring. Goddess Kring Radio, Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring, Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring.